Oh, you're damn right. I don't got no filter, buddy. And uh, we uh, got a very special guest today. Uh, usually, we talk about a lot of the bad stuff that happens in the scene on Biker News. Uh, lately, I've been getting some very good guests, and we got today one of the most positive freaking guys that I know. He went through something uh, that was life-changing, and I know me, man, it, it, me, I'd be FTW every damn thing if this happened to me. But it just goes to show you that there is a lot of positive people out there that really can show somebody the way. I know my guest, uh, Mike Ball, he got it uh, contacted by China Dow because uh, she got uh, somebody that contacted her about a motorcycle accident and he was an amputee. And she put him in uh, contact with Mike. Mike didn't have to do it, and he did it anyway. And I heard he is uh, doing real good now, recovering and stuff. But this is somebody that you really got to listen to, where you can feel a vibe that comes off to him. He's also getting involved in social media. You guys got to go watch him over on Instagram. He talks over on Instagram all the time. So we're going to give him some love today. We're going to sit here, talk about his experiences and what he's looking forward to the future. So let's bring in Mikey. What's up, Mike? What's going on, everybody? Hey, uh, Hollywood, I want to thank you first and foremost for having me on the platform and everybody in here. Thank you guys for having me. I appreciate you guys listening and hearing me out. Look at him all uh, professional behind that uh, setup right there, man. That is hey, something. We just we just set it up. Come on, man. Like my old <laughs> setup used to be way better. So we just moved into this brand new house. So come on, we working with. I don't know, know, man. I I seen Sos. He was doing uh, when he goes out there. Where the hell do you get all those lights and stuff from? Okay. Is that a professional studio or something? So are you talking about where you saw like the dance floor and stuff like that? Yeah. Okay, so I built a house next to my house <laughs> that I called it the stream house. And this was before my accident. And uh -huh. I was a content creator and I, I used to stream like eight hours a day, dude, and like when I was off of work. And um, I built that room specific. I had four 75 inch QLED TVs on each wall and then a whole dance floor, one out of three. Uh, in the entire United States. One was owned wow. by Beyonce, one was owned by me, and one was owned by a guy that like rents them out. You know what I mean? To like club owners. You need to rent that out, man, because I was like- I, I need to rent out the studio, but it's kind of complicated because it's on my parents' property. You know what I mean? Oh, that so is complicated right yeah, there. That's, it's not as easy as it sounds. In the introduction, I was talking about you having a life-changing event and we'll go a lot into your future with creating and stuff like that because I think it's a wonderful thing. You had an event that I would only sit there and say, God damn, man. Uh, I wouldn't know what to do. I'd be against the world. And I actually did a short a while ago where I asked if people were ever in a motorcycle accident how the hell they got back on that bike after that kind of a traumatic experience. So I'd like to, you know, you to tell everybody about your bike accident and how you got back up on that sucker. And uh, let's go from there. Yeah. Um, so March 6th of 2021, I was headed home from a charity event that I had attended with my club at the time. And um, as I had parted away from the pack, um, I was only a, two blocks away from home. And uh, that's usually when people go, all right, see you, bro. Like as people are breaking off in the pack, like you made it home. You know what I mean? You got it. So as you know, where the, the pack continues to go its way, um, that's unfortunately when I was riding about, you know, 45, 50 miles per hour, which is like the speed limit right there. And like the, where just people live, just housing tracks. And unfortunately, there was this car that made a an illegal left turn over two lanes. And when she hit me, she hit me at 80 miles per hour. Oh, 
Um, so when she hit me, though, she T-boned me exactly where the leg is. You know, where are you riding on? Everyone knows a Dyna, right? So that you're riding like my feet aren't all the way out like how other people are across the nation. Here on the West Coast, we ride them like dirt bikes. So that my legs are straight up and down at a 90 degree. So they're mids. So while I'm riding like that, that's where she chopped me right there, right then and there. And as soon as she hit me, that's when my leg got completely torn off and then obliterated into a million pieces. And then I went flying, like, I think it was like a hundred plus feet. So yeah. Did you lose consciousness at all? No, I was, I was awake for all of it from the second, obviously that it, I got hit. Um, all the way in from, I remember tumbling and all of that. And then once I finally stopped tumbling, I looked down and I saw that I had no leg, no left leg. And as mm -hmm. soon as I saw that no left leg, I saw myself pumping out like blood, like as if it was a garden hose, like it was coming out. Every time my heart would pump, it was coming out. So I went to go tourniquet myself with my own belt but I went to go do it and I couldn't move my own arms. Well, it turns out that I broke my scapula, I broke a lot of part, you know, I actually, this whole shoulder uh, was obliterated. So there was no real left shoulder. Uh, so now that it's a titanium plate with like five or six different five inch screw nails, you know, mm. medical, but that, that's how my left shoulder is now. But anywho, um, I went to go tourniquet myself because obviously I know that's what I got to do to stay alive. You know, I've been in an industry where I've understood, you know, very medical stuff. I mean, just basic normal medical stuff that you would know. I went to go do it. And as I went to go do it, couldn't do it. And that frustration was off the hook. Like I couldn't, I couldn't even tell you because I'm sitting there going, Oh my God, like I'm going to die. Like, there's nothing I can do at this point from here on out. At least I died doing what I love doing, you know? Mm. And Not, uh, at any yeah, point, but, if you don't want to answer, you, you don't have to. No, I, I'm a, I'm a wide open book, so it's okay. What, what was it like seeing that car come at you like that and know it wasn't going to stop? And what could have, uh, because you just brought up it was a left-hand turn. That's what a lot of accidents happens with these left-hand turns. So what was going through your mind seeing it coming at you? And what right. would you tell motorists about, hey, man, about watching for motorcycles? Well, I'll explain this so that, I mean, because everyone on here is a motorcyclist and pretty much understands like lane positions, right? So I'm on the, the there's, there's lane one and two. And within that one lane, uh, that is like the far left lane, um, there's lane position one, two, and three. And I'm in one while I'm traveling home because I'm, I'm going to make a left-hand turn half a block away from where I got hit to go home. Well, unfortunately, I didn't make it there, right? But I saw the body language of the car. You can tell a bo the body language. And when I saw it, I saw it as like, I, I could see it wanting to like turn, but as it went to go do it, it, it was like right as it passed my peripheral vision, I couldn't see the car, right as I couldn't see the car anymore. That's when I got hit. Mm. So I thought I cleared her. Like I literally thought like, oh my God, thank God I cleared her, but nope. That's when my leg got completely taken off. Mm -hmm. Now, is it true what they say that your life passes in front of you in an accident like that? Um, I wouldn't say it passes by you, but I'll tell you that your world goes from every freedom that we know, everything that we complain about on this planet. You go from this entire world down to the size of a dime. And when that happens to you, it's really humbling. You know, mm. um, you, you realize what's really important in life. It's not necessarily all of this 
controversy, all this BS, or it, it really comes down to like, whoa, what is important in life? You know, man, that's something that I wish everybody would think of uh, on a daily basis, especially when they get into drama or they get into this poor me attitude. Uh, what you just said now, uh, Nitro asked, uh, who helped you out? And uh, do you uh, still talk to him today if uh, somebody did help you out? Well, there was there was a lot of people that helped me out throughout my process. Um, I always say that it would be <laughs> very selfish of me to say that I did this by myself. I didn't. Um, I always say it's about who you surround yourself with, honestly. And um, thank God for the people that I, I do have. I would obviously include my parents in there. Like, who, who's going to take care of you when when you're down? Like, is your is your brothers that 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 you ride quote unquote with gonna be wiping your ass when when you can't get out of bed? You know what I mean? Like you're you're gonna figure out like whoa like all right like this is some intense stuff. All right, man. Like I understand like the the extremity of this, you know. Mm, and moms and pops are usually always there for their but, kids. But 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 to answer your question, it, to come around is. There are special people that I will say that obviously my parents, my uh, my immediate family, and then um, my my big brother, Big Drift. Big mm. Drift was a big, big reason why I am here today. You know what I mean? Well, you got to give him a shout out right there to Big Drift. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, when you said you were bleeding out, was somebody able to come and uh, give you a tourniquet? So what ended up happening is when I got hit, apparently I didn't see the guy, but I went flying by a guy that was on an electric, you know, bicycle, you know, one of those electric bicycles. Well, this dude's like in his like fifties and this guy has never, he hasn't worn a belt and or pants in the last like 15, 20 years. And it just so happened that his wife, his old lady had bought him some brand new pair of pants and and it didn't fit him so he needed to wear a belt and he went out on a you know kind of a when i got hit it was 4 p.m so he went out during the afternoon it was a little chilly out it was march you know d down by the beach so he's he's out there riding and i went flying by him when i got hit now, by the time he had gotten to me, it wasn't like he got to me right on the scene. You know what I mean? It took a freaking minute. It wasn't, it wasn't like, oh yeah, boom, he's right there. I every thought that you could possibly think of came to me. And then it was like, okay, I'm gonna die. And then that's when he came running up, brother Jeff George, massive shout out. Um, totally random person. Uh, comes running up out of nowhere and I look at him and I go, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. And he goes, you ain't dying today. He pulls off his belt, tourniquets me right where my leg is bleeding. And he pulls as hard as he can. This is a six foot man. And he's pushing against with his other foot, pulling as hard as he can. Cause you got to really stop that blood flow. And these are right. main arteries that are leaking, you know? So he's pulling as hard as he can and he's, pushing his leg against the open wound. Like it's like as hard as he could to close it. So that, that was a, uh, that was hardcore for sure. Now and you so, said you, you thought you were going to die. Did you find any moment of peace with them thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, I did. I did. Uh, like I said, like it was like, at least I did what I loved, you know, that day we had fed, like no joke we had fed the entire county of orange you know what i mean we it was it we had churches and truckloads we had we had so much product of food just food in general that just i cannot believe how much we gave away there were semi trucks coming in forklifts i mean it was it was a life changing day in itself you know for me to experience anyway you know mm. but it, it wasn't like, yeah, like everything is screwed or anything. 
the only the only real thought that came through my head is I looked down as this was all happening after I assessed what happened. The only other thought that came to my head was if I'm going to survive this, like if I have to accept it now. Well, here we are now. I accepted it. Mm. You know what I mean? Right. Were you wearing a helmet at the time? Because I know that's the first question the news media says. Full face. I was wearing a full face awry helmet. Yeah. They don't pay me to say nothing, but I still even have the original helmet in the garage. That mm-hmm. my, the first thing that hit was my head on the curb where the red curb is for, you know, the fire trucks or whatever. Do not park. That was the first thing that hit my, you know, the head. And then the whole jawline was actually gone, you know, beat up too. So who Mm. knows if I would have even been able to talk again, you know? Right. Now, that's one thing you hear me talking about with China now on arguing back and forth on the second part of the show sometimes Mm -hmm. is making her wear a helmet now. And I know everybody has their own choice about wearing a helmet. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, for me... It's like, as I got older, I started learning as I started seeing people and now hearing your story about the helmet, would you have been able to survive without it? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I mean, I got hit at 80 miles per hour. I was riding at 50. So think how far I flew. Let's Mm. just do basic math of just how, I mean, she, it wasn't like, okay, like you said about the left-hand turn thing, a lot of cars turn left and then the biker hits them and then they go flying over the hood or they go flying this way. That's not what happened to me. I got literally T-boned at the leg right on the side. Boom. And when that happened, I went flying that way. Boom. Mm -hmm. Now he's going on your tourniquet and stuff. Did time slow down for you? No, no. I, every, everything and everything including pain time it just it just seemed like i'm just sitting there okay when is this <laughs> when am i going to die or when am i going to get put out you know mm-hmm. so it was definitely cuz the the pain was a thousand out of 10 like right. no joke pain no joke pain mm-hmm. now how long did it take for the paramedics to get there it felt like forever um but i will say According to the police report, it was something like either eight or 10 minutes or something like that. I can't remember the exact amount, but it seemed like forever, you know, from after they were called. Because after I got hit, got assessed, all that, that's when I pulled out my phone and I I unlocked my phone, gave it to somebody. And I said, call this number. You know what I mean? Because I'm completely conscious the whole time, even in the in the paramedics. When I get into the fu- freaking paramedics, I uh, never never got knocked out or anything. They gave me doses of wow. fentanyl, and it felt like water. That stuff was. I got two doses maximum. Boom, mm-hmm. felt like water. Hey, I don't have zero pain reduction. Hit me again. Boom, zero pain reduction. What are we gonna do? We can't do anything for you, sir. Wow. Wow. Now you ended up uh, going into the hospital. Did you have surgery or? Yeah, I had four surgeries. So the original first surgery was just to make sure not only do they amputate right from where, because my leg got chopped off. Most 99% of amputees get chopped off at the actual surgeon board. You know what I mean? For me, Mm. the car decided where my leg got chopped off. So right. when I got to the hospital, the, the asphalt from the, from the actual fall went up into my residual leg and went all the way into my kneecap. You know what yeah. I mean? So, so, yeah. so they're doing surgery not only on my, my – and also the nerves. So the nerves, usually when they cut you at, at the, on the board, they take almost like a soldering iron. And they like hit the ends of the nerves and it like kind of like helps them like heal right. And you don't have so much pain. Um, Mm -hmm. With me, by the time I got there, my, my nerves were dead. So now I have a complication that 
most amputees don't even have. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So it's a different different level of pain for sure. Now, waking up after some of them surgeries and stuff and laying in that hospital bed, how did you turn it into a positive? How the hell did you do that? That's the easiest question on the planet. I just lived through everything I just told you. So when I woke up, the moment I woke up from the first surgery, I was all smiles. Because I lived through that. I just... I rem- it's not like I forgot what just happened. You know mm. what I mean? I, I just lived through what just happened and I couldn't believe. And I told myself, if I'm going to live through this, I got to accept it. And I did from the second I woke up and it was like, okay, now we got to do three more amput- or two more amputations. And then obviously we got to do a whole plate and all of that to resurgically make your shoulder, you know? Right. Wow. <laughs> Uh, I know when uh, the one guy contacted China down, I said, you know, you got to put him in contact with Mike, because if you don't go through something like that, you're never going to understand any of it. Well, that's that's the one thing I say is like I like I, I understand people that want to try to help. And it's so hard because it's like I want to help so bad. Right. But it's like unless you relate like you can under you can try to understand, but unless you relate to someone on that traumatic level, how are you going to help? So, for instance, the guy that you're talking about, respectfully, I spoke to him today. He got his first pro, uh, uh, permanent prosthetic leg two days ago, and he messaged oh, it to me and he showed awesome. it to me and everything. So, I'm not going to show his his stuff off, but. Just so you know, he's doing very well. And, and of course, I ask with everybody that I talk to that reaches out, I, mm. I always ask about their pain levels, how they're dealing with it. Because, you know, for me, I quit all my pain meds while I was in the hospital. So I, I was I didn't believe in that because I've seen so many people die. I know amputees to this day, they're 15, 20 years in that are still o- using opiates, still using narcos, still using oxys and all this stuff. It's like. Dude, you're just using that as a as an excuse, like to not man up here. Like you need to like face this, you know. Mm-hmm. And do you think a, a doctor contributes to that, where they just keep writing scripts? Yes and no, because my doctor was willing to write scripts as well, and they also gave me a twenty percent chance of walking again. So laugh out loud, right? You know what I mean? I'm over here riding right. on twos. <laughs> you know, I, and I never, I never even believed them anyways. I was like, man, whatever. Come on. As, keep your BS to yourself, man. It's all, it's all good. I'm going to, I'm going to do my own thing. <laughs> no, man. I, I don't know. It, it, yeah, of course the doctors are, are over prescribing to some people. I'm going to be honest while I was in the actual hospital itself, they never made me comfortable. The 26 days I was in there, they never actually made me comfortable. They never put like a real good amount of like stuff where I could be like out of pain, no matter what, I was always at a nine out of 10 pain. Oh, minimum, my. minimum, minimum. And my dad would be calling the charge nurse because my parents can't even visit me. I think March 6th of 2021. This is mm-hmm. during the middle of COVID. My parents right. couldn't even visit me. Man. So I for 26 nip- days, I couldn't have any visitors. So, you know what I mean? It, it was definitely uh, very rough to, to, to deal with on that, on that aspect. You know what I mean? But they, my dad would be calling them going, dude, why are you not helping my son get to the point of like, you know, where he's not so much in pain. And um, I don't know. I felt like they were, they, 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 they held back a lot. I don't know. It was weird. But I, mm-hmm. re- regardless of the fact I still made it through. I I still think I should have been helped out more in the hospital. Nonetheless, I'm I'm here now, and I don't use any of it. Uh, Jason wants to ask you. Uh, just curious, has religion played a role with your mental health and positivity with all this? And if so, how? Um. Of course. I. This is what I say. I feel like. God kept me around because 
there was definitely a purpose. You know what I mean? There was there was a reason for it. Um, but I'm gonna be um a hundred percent honest. I do not sit here and and say and give credit all to um religion. I of course one thousand percent connect to religion. Uh you know, I'm a Christian myself, but um I don't necessarily relate that to necessarily that. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I play it as a chain of events that happened perfectly. You know what I mean? Right. And if it didn't happen exactly the way it did, I mean, you replay that that scene one million times over, I'm dead one million times over. You know what I mean? And I get the miracle factor there that you guys are probably in the chat getting at that like, hey, look, this is God's plan. And I do also agree with that, but it wasn't something that made my positive mental awareness or attitude. That wasn't the the biggest factor. No. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How the hell did you get back on a bike after all that? And, oh if, and before that, did the broad at least stop? So she had nowhere to go to because she turned in. So she, she was over the drinking limit okay and she was a drunk driver and she made that turn uh and as she was amazing making that turn she was turning into her house her her house is four houses down where are you gonna run to so she sat there in the car with her hands at the wheel from the second she hit me she put her hands on the wheel didn't look at me or anything, didn't look my way, and she was going to let me bleed up. Oh, my God. She just sat there. She, I think she was in shock. But she also, to put in perspective as well, she was 73 years old. 73 and drunk. 73 and drunk coming from the bar. Yeah, at 4.30 p.m. Wow. Man. How I'm did you get to- on how did you get on a bike after that? That just that makes your blood boil hearing that she was 73 drunk in uh the middle of an afternoon. Yeah, no, um, I, I take it as a freak incident, you know what I mean? Uh I know that we all go through tragic stuff in our life, and I really do feel like it's about conquering one thing and then moving on to the next. And it's like gladiator school, you know, and I look at it that way. So for me, hopping back on a bike was almost like therapy rather than it being a fear. Um, it was something like every single day that I didn't have a leg because it takes a long time to, to get to the point. Well, long time for me, it took me two months, 30 days out of the hospital. Once I got my leg, I could barely walk. I'm, I'm using a cane just to like, be a, you know, I'm, I'm really being hard headed instead of being in a wheelchair. I'm like, no, I can walk, you know what I mean? I'm fine. And I hop on the motorcycle to go take some pictures, you know what I mean? And I just start, I just turn it on and I fired up and I just took off. And that <laughs> ever, and ever since that moment, it was caught all live. You know what I mean? Like, Oh my uh-huh. God, like this, my, like my mom and dad, they're freaking out. They're just like, dude, there's no way this guy just took off in his motorcycle just now. There's no way. <laughs> you riding so, a Dyna still? Yeah, yeah, FXDB. Yeah. <laughs> You're never gonna get rid of that sucker, are you? Well, it's so I've been through a couple of them. So the one that that I went down on was completely totaled to the fact that it was shattered, 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 and that bike was, let's just say as Dyna bro out as it gets like it, it was top of the top tier. And Mm. then once that got destroyed and I got paid out basically nothing from the insurance, um, my big brother, big drift, uh, built that Dyna that you see now. And I went down on the 91 freeway after I went, uh, after I lost my leg, I went down in April of uh 2022 and then he fixed it again and gave it back to me (laughs) so (laughs) i've had that one go down a couple of times oh man you got to keep that thing up front man hey there was there was a southern california is some different 
people and and people drive erratic out here. I mean, it's just crazy. Come to Chicago, man. We'll uh, debate that. <laughs> I don't know, man. I, 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 I'm going to tell you, I think I'm on par with you. <laughs> so have you ever thought about uh, starting something to where you go around, give uh, speeches, or you give uh how can I say it? You're, you yeah, know, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Like the, the, the seminars. conferences and seminars and stuff like that. And yeah, that's, su that's stuff that I, I would love to do and continue to participate in is to mm -hmm. be able to, you know, like my, my favorite thing is to be able to burn out on stage uh, with my bike, you know what I mean? And then I, I, I flop down the kickstand with my left foot, which is obviously a fake left foot flop mm. down the kickstand throw down the bike and get on the motor uh, on the uh, microphone and start talking about going, you know, this is just the beginning of your life. You know, it's just starting now, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, no, this is something that I have to like, I have to be pe with the people that are bedside. Like I have to be bedside with them that are going through these times of unknown because I was that one guy, you know, like I always say, if you help that one person, then you've done your job. I say mm -hmm. that because I was that one guy, you know what I mean? I got yeah. that, you know? And so me being able to show to the world and go, look, your life is not over this. You can still have a meaningful, fulfilling, prosperous life, but it's all dependent on you because honestly, let's be honest from all of this, from the accident, I could have sat here and, and laid up on the couch and nobody would have blamed me. Let's be real. But mm. at the same token, I'm going to lose every single person in my circle. So instead of being selfish, I had to look at myself and go, okay, what do I need to work on? Like the way you better the world is bettering yourself. Then it is a trickle down effect for everyone that's inside of your world. You're going to change everyone else's world. That's how it works. Well said, well said. Over on Insane Wheels, I just did a video about statistics and stuff like that, about uh, the dif different classes of motorcycles and the classes that have the highest uh, fatality rate. And you being through this, right? and of course, everybody knows the t statistics that it was the, the rockets, crotch rockets, uh, the speed demons, whatever you want to call them that was the highest risk for fatalities and you try to tell them kind of riders hey you know what personally i believe them bikes are made for the track i love moto america i love watching them race but i think they belong on a track i 100 percent agree just wanted to say but yes and i showed some b-roll of some of these bikes going 240 to uh, up to 300 miles an hour on highways and just hearing how you got hit at 80 miles an hour from a car i couldn't imagine what the hell would happen at 250 miles an hour if you hit a pebble me and you wouldn't be talking right uh, i, that, I that's, that's that's just that's just simple plain and simple you know what i mean we wouldn't be talking so what do you think that needs to change with them type of riders where, you know, and I know they're young and stuff like that. And if us older guys had that type of bike, we'd probably be doing the same thing when we were their eggs, but how do we get them to understand, Hey, not only are you making everybody look bad, but you're going to kill yourself. Literally. I think if people actually genuinely understood structure, you know, like if you, I'm going to be respectful here, but how many club guys do you know that are riding at 220 miles per hour? Not many. <laughs> right. That's Not because many. that's because we've been through it. We've we have discipline. We have self-control. And if you didn't, guess what? You're getting fined by the road captain. You do some dumb stuff in our pack and you put anybody in jeopardy, 
we'll pull you out of the pack. It's done. You're done, dude. Like we're, we're having a serious talk with you. You know what I mean? Like the thing is, is I think it's a lack of people that are actually guiding them. And, um, probably a lot of people that want to be that independent, like completely, I don't want to hear, I don't want to hear what you have to say. All I want to say, and that's it, you know? Mm -hmm. And I say, go ahead, rock your, your, your freedom of speech, your freedom to do whatever you want, but there is a freedom to get your ass whooped too. You know what I mean? And (laughs) you know, it's, it's just the truth. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, I seen some of the B-roll, how they were on the highway. They would actually have the drag racing on the highway. And they even think it's cute to uh, try to outrun the cops uh, on this type of stuff. But I don't think they have, you know, for those people doing it, have actual respect for the motorcycle. Because I always believe the motorcycle is like a gun. If you don't treat it right, it's going to go off on you. You said it best right there. You you treat a motorcycle, and like I said, it, go, it goes back to a lack of respect, right? It's not just a lack of respect for everything else. It's a lack of respect for the motorcycle and, and the machinery itself. People don't understand the power of these things. Like People will go out and buy these leader bikes as their first bike. Never ran a motorcycle, have never even been through an MSF course. You know what I mean? And they go buy a freaking leader bike that's 250 pounds at 250 mile or horsepower. What do you expect to happen? The guy has never even used a throttle before. You know what I mean? Like, what do you what 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 do you expect to happen on this? You're just that's a recipe for disaster. Um, I don't know, man. I like I said with the Harley scene, I think it's more of a different mentality of like, hey, at least with me, I can speak only for me. It was more militant. It was more mm-hmm. militant. And and if I ever saw anybody doing something, even including myself as an officer, let's say, if I saw someone doing something outrageous in a pack or even just something to put anybody at jeopardy, there's an issue. You know what I mean? So and what a, um, sports bike riders don't get is people cannot judge how fast you're going in a car. No, no. When, when you look back in the mirror... <laughs> And you're in a cage doing 65, 70. I'm going to promise you, when someone's rolling at 220 miles per hour and this guy just wants to get over to the left lane and it looks clear, it looks clear to that dude at 220 miles per hour. It looks clear. I promise you, it was clear. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, it It was clear until you came up illegally, you know. Well, I always debated myself because I'm all for freedom and stuff like that. Right. But I don't understand how they're able to put them type of machines on the road when they know what the hell's going uh, to happen to a lot of people that ride it. And that's been going on since I was 15 years old thinking because my older brother got killed yep. on one by a drunk. I'm and sorry to hear that. Yeah, he died on a jigster. But at the same time, you know, I remember my mother saying, you know, don't buy that bike. Don't buy that bike. And he was one of them guys out there pulling wheelies and all Doing that. The nine yards. Yeah. yeah. Damn. And it's like you ask yourself, how the hell did you allow these motorcycles to become street legal? Because anything 600 uh, CC and below with one of them is considered a sport. Anything over that's a super sport. Right. And some of these bikes, like uh, the abuses and stuff, are outrageous. They belong on a drag strip at that point. No, I absolutely agree. And that's exactly why the insurance companies F you guys up. You know what I mean? Anybody that rides a rice rocket, your insurance versus my insurance per month, I promise you, I'm probably saving multi hundreds of dollars just because mm. of that very reason because mm. the 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 statistics of these rice rockets of these people dying on these things is like massive so the the insurance companies are going why would i even like really front the money for this guy and this motorcycle when we know that 7 out of 10 times this thing is going to wrap be wrapped up on a tree you know mm. So that's why the insurance companies are the way they are. 
You know, you could be, you could argue all day long. I'm the best rider ever. It doesn't matter. I like to race. Doesn't matter. They go by statistics. You know what I mean? Mm. And that's why my insurance is probably, well, I already know it's under three, you know, it's under a hundred bucks. So I'm right. fine. You know what I mean? <laughs> what got you in the dinos, man? Uh, Honestly, my big brother. And it, and also on top of that, the guys I was hanging around at the time, I was a young influence, you know, easily influenced kid. You know what I mean? I'm sitting there watching all my, my, my brothers getting tattooed and they're all tattoo artists, you know what I mean? And so that's how I got into the culture a little bit. Cause I'd see them ride up at, you know, 18 deep, you know, they roll up to the tattoo shop. I'm like 16, 17 years old, hanging out with the fam. I'm not getting tattooed or nothing. I'm just chilling. And these guys come rolling in deep at like 18 and they're coming in, like moving the crowd for real, you know, coming in, showing like, this is, this is the real deal. When I saw that and I saw that brotherhood, I was like, I got to be a part of that. And I'm a kid, you know? So I was riding motocross for 10 years prior to all of this. So when I moved over to Harley's when I was 23, it was instant club. You know what I mean? It was like, I'm, mm. I already know I'm going into the club scene. Well, before we get into your content creation and stuff, one thing that's always intrigued me, and I always wanted to ask somebody, say, on the West Coast, East Coast, what makes the West Coast motorcycle scene different than the rest of the country? 1,000% custom. We are custom. You, we, There's nothing else out here in the world that is like over here. There is mm. nothing. There is a reason why we have the name that we do. There's a reason why people come here to look at these, you know, either whether you call them Cholo bikes or Viklas or whatever you call them, you know, like there's a reason why the people will spend hundreds of hundreds of thousands of dollars to get the engraving, sketching, uh, you know, $50,000 paint jobs, you name it. Like it's, it's just people go all out. And I think at least where I live, and I'm not saying that anywhere else isn't this way. Don't mistake this. Just at least from what I've experienced in my own cities and that stuff like that is that we love so hard that, 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 that is the reason why it shows on the street. You know what mm. I mean? That we love so hard. We were so into what we do and it's all in or nothing. You know what I mean? And it's always been competition, you know, Southern California, especially is very competition oriented. So we are always going for the best of the best of the best. Mm. You know? Well, one thing that's uh real close uh, related as far as art and, you know, I'm a huge fan of, I actually had uh, one, is the lowrider scene. Now, Kelly is known for their lowriders, and you're talking about artistic customization and stuff. I think that crosses over from the lowrider scene into the bike scene. It does. It does. Um, you know, my big brother as well was a part of... Um, Another very, very, very well-known car club uh, retired after 15 years. Uh, still to this day has multiple low riders. Um, we shoot music videos all the time in it and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, man, it's it's a beautiful thing to see all of us kind of get together. It's like we do it collaboratively. Like we, we come together rather than like keep it separate. You know, a lot of people go, oh, well, you're on the car scene. You stay over there. And then like motorcycles are over here. It's like with that culture, they all, they, they want it to be combined. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think West Coast is the trendsetter as far as motorcycles? Absolutely. So, and so is the East Coast. The East Coast is, is as well. And I think what ends up happening is both sides end up bleeding into the central part of the rest of uh, the United States, at least from what I've seen from the trends, from all the bike culture leading up to now. Mm -hmm. Rock and roll, man. I think you're correct too, with uh, a lot of stuff comes out of the West coast is, you know, you have 
choppers from the 60s 70s a lot of that stuff came out of the west coast uh right. then went to the east coast and then the middle of the country it's like uh the midwest the flyover country man is true we everybody flies right over us but uh let's get into some of your creating stuff and how you got involved i know you work with uh sos over at demons row and stuff tell me a little bit about that uh how things going and then uh you know what you did before then and what you're going to do now yeah man um so i'm very blessed to have been picked up by a, an amazing pr team um, so because of that, shout out to ICT PR, they have, uh, definitely put me in really good positions to be able to speak at such as I, I'm, I'm soon to speak at ABC good morning and good morning America and, uh, doing some really big things to be able to talk on, I, I would guess controversial subjects. Um, so I'm very blessed in that regard. Um, when it comes to the actual like Demons Row stuff, I've always been a part of Demons Row. Um, I was before my accident. And then when I woke up from my accident, this is what made me and Sos get so close was because when I woke up from my accident, he was live that Sunday. He called it live church. So I called in and I was like, hey, bro, I lost my leg, but hey, I'm going to I'm going to get back on a bike here and however long and I'm going to be back on twos, you know what I mean? And that was my message to everybody as soon as I woke up. And ever since then we got super close. And then we, we just were like, man, we're good at what we do content wise and stuff like that. Why can't we work together? You know? And I really feel that that should be the way for everybody. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I think that should be everybody in the content space because we are all individuals and though we are all affiliated to things, I feel like if we can benefit in a way, why not benefit? You know, why does it have to be only like it's like saying, oh, you're 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 only a part of this club. I'm not talking to you. You know what I mean? Like for me, it's like, no, I want to I want to be here with everyone, you know? Right. Welcome. New member made for the streets. Eighty two hundred. Appreciate all the support, buddy. Uh, that is awesome. 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 But you're more, and I've noticed this, you're more of an Instagram guy now. Yeah. Or were, you, or were you a Twitch guy before then? So I was a Twitch guy before then, probably around 2018 through 2020, I was a Twitch guy. And that was my main thing, which is another platform, if you guys don't know. To, it's kind of like another platform meant for live streaming, such as what we're doing right now. We're live. But usually it's meant for gaming and stuff like that. And you're showing your other screen of you playing the video game. Anywho, uh, I, I got tired of that, you know. And so once I left that and I was really mainly focused, I had gotten so many priorities to do and responsibilities now that I was a part of a national cabinet of a motorcycle club. I had so many responsibilities that I had no time to sit there and stream video games anymore. Like I, I, I was, I was communicating, communicating across the world. So it was like, okay, I got to focus on this rather than video games. Right. So I did that. And then once I was able to do what I am doing now, content wise, I was able to really step out of that and be able to talk about me as an individual and how I think, how I feel, um, the experiences I've been through. Um, I hate when people talk about experiences that they personally have not gone through because then it's like, why are you even listening to that person? You know? Um, but it's like, I don't know. I love talking about what I've gone through and for people to be able to relate. So then they can go, wow, I can see that there really is another side to this. You know what I mean? Mm. You know, one thing I uh, go back and forth in my mind all the time is how much social media has really changed the scene. Have you ever noticed that? It changed the scene massively. And it's not just social media. It was the public perception is so rough. You know what I mean? You got, you got the stupid gangland that, that wanted to be monetized and make money. You have the sons of anarchies, which of course, yes, 
we all probably can agree. Great entertainment, uh, but not realistic. Same thing with Mayans, whatever, BS, it's it's not realistic. It's not real life, it's entertainment and supposed to be taken as such. Um, but public perception has been messed up and especially when it comes to social media. People are going to go ahead and report and, and, and record everything that they see. And then they're only going to clip the part that they that is clickbait, you hmm. know? And so anything can be looked at. I mean, it's almost like I, I almost look at every video and go, let me actually dissect this because let me see if it's been edited. Let me see if you cut the scenes. You know what I mean? Because everything is so skewed nowadays. It's not straightforward like me and you, Hollywood, like what we're doing right now. This is mm. a one take, no cuts, no BS. It's us talking. You know what I mean? You know how it is. You went through the natural uh, geographic BS. You saw how that played. <laughs> yeah, them cocksuckers. Yeah. <laughs> Same thing. You know, so right. social media has, has, has messed that up a lot because it's not just social media. It, it's allowed every person to feel, feel like they have a platform. That's why. Right. Well, I have to agree with that. And uh, before we even came on air, I was talking about my other channel, Insane Wheels. And you were even mentioning in the second half of the show that I do with China Dow. And if you watch it closely, you can see the different ways I get into something. And that's been on my mind for the last six months. It had to be six months because let's face it, wow. I've been doing this stuff forever. And at some point in time, you got to start putting out the stuff that you want to put out, you know, and insane wheels has been the big thing. Cause all I do is talk motorcycles over there, even though I piss on some Wheaties over there a little bit now. Uh, <laughs> but you got to start doing stuff that you like doing. Yes. And, and if you truly love the, if you truly love the passion of whatever you're doing, like whatever concept of what you're doing, whatever road you're following, if you truly love it, then you're, forever going to prosper. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? I, I really feel like happiness should be valued as some sort of currency because it's not anymore. Like everything is defined. Success is defined by money. You know what yeah. I mean? And, and instead of that, like, why aren't we defining success with happiness? But like, I want to wait, I, like when I wake up in the morning, if I wake up in the morning and I thank God that I woke up today, and I'm saying, I'm so thankful I woke up today. Isn't there some sort of value in that? You know what I mean? And, and, it, and, and it's dramatic to me. It's way it's worth more than if you were to wake me up with a hundred dollar bill, because honestly money come in, comes and goes, but I'm mm. sitting here going, man, I'm stoked to be here today. You know what I mean? And I legitimately, since the day that this happened to me, I wake up every single day grateful because it's just a different mindset than I was before. Exactly. Uh, that's well said right there. And I've actually noticed some other creators, because again, if you watch their videos, you can tell that are kind of going through the same thing where they're changing things up uh, and it looks like they're having more fun at doing it. Hell, I see it with Sosa all the time now. Uh, he concentrates on other stuff. He does shorts and comes up with some pretty good topics that ain't the mainstay or core, what we would call our audience anymore, right. but you see the creator having fun. And yeah, I, it, and I think right. it goes to, you know what? Cause a lot of people think we make a ton of money on YouTube. That's a bullshit lie. I wish. It Hold was. on. Who? <laughs> oh, let me just stop everyone right here, right now. If you guys think we're killing it on YouTube, you guys are wildly, wildly ignorant on the subject. I'm sorry. Damn right. Tell so, them, Mike. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, especially when it comes to creation of, of any type of content, is that it seems like at least, and I, it feels like this every time, is 
it's a system that you put in all this work, all this video, all of this, and it's never enough. It's never full. You just keep feeding it, feeding it, feeding it, and it's never full. It's never good enough. It's never this. It's never that. And, and that's what's really hard about content creators. Everyone goes, yeah, hats off to you for being an entrepreneur, but no one knows the back struggle of all of this, you know? Basically, you come out making less than minimum wage in most states with these if, things. If you broke even with the products, all the stuff that you had to buy for all your hardware and all that, you're lucky if you broke even. Exactly. But I do like seeing the change in some of the older creators branching out from what their comfort zone is. And then seeing somebody like you on Instagram, it's like, wow, man, we're, you know, we might be bikers, but we're also human beings talking about other subjects. Absolutely. And that's, that's my favorite thing is like, I have a, a big biker following, but I talk about these like interesting topics and things that like you now do, you know, with your second part of the show, you bring mm -hmm. up a lot of different uh, either controversial subjects or things that people are talking about in the media, whatever. And I'll usually put my two cents in on how I feel not about like, Hey, this guy, this guy, none of that. Hmm. It's usually about how our concept is about our mind state. And my big thing is, is preaching and talking about positive mental attitude, PMA and hmm. learning and understanding how to, you know, decide when to fight because like as black dragon says in this part, you can be right or you can be dead. Right. You know, there's so many, there's so many things that you can do. Sure. You could be right, but is it worth it? It, this can go with your old lady. This can go with your mom. This can go with your, with a 1% motorcycle club. This can go for your kids. It can go for anybody. You know, it just is what it is, man. You know, mm -hmm. And so I talk about real subjects, you know, uh, people are going to treat you the way that you allow people to treat you. You know, those are, well, that's one of the many things I talk about, you know, do you find it more fulfilling being able to talk about stuff that ain't the norm? Like my, they consider me a shock jock and I get really out there. Have you guys ever seen the second half of the show? I get out there. I love it too. I believe in tailoring myself to the working man. I don't believe in elite stuff or any of that. I believe about, uh, you know, entertaining the guys that go to work and uh, put food on their, you know, food on the table for their family and stuff. And I really think that's been lost. I Is agree. I agree on that. And there's not a lot of people that are willing in or understand what hard work is anymore. Like previous to my accident, you know, I was fueling ships for 10 years. So I was out at sea for 21 days and then I'd be at home for 21 days. So mm. I'd, I'd be gone and I'd be fueling these ships running anywhere from 1.2 to $2.3 billion worth of cargo at a time. And if I mess up at any point, at any point, any type of negligence, that's 15 minimum years of prison you wow. know what i mean so it was like i was doing this at 18 years old still in high school mm -hmm. so i didn't you know to this day i'm like contrary to like what the normal motorcycle club dude persona that the, the the conception of what the the media thinks we are i've never even put anything up my nose the worst I've done is smoke weed because let's be honest. Oh, we smoking Mary Jane, baby. <laughs> I've got some nerve issues, you know what I mean? And it, it doesn't take away the pain, but it allows me to focus on something else rather than focus on the pain, right? So there's so many things that people don't understand that I love to talk about. And these are these are subjects I'm just skipping over. But those are mm. many examples. Yes. If you guys got questions for Mike, we'll get a question and answer session in here. Mike, what is your Instagram Powell motto? How you doing, buddy? Sunshine, my girl out there. Never shock me. <laughs> the Instagram is at ball valve TV. B 
B-A-L-L-V-A-L-V-E. Valve. If you can, uh, if any of my moderators could put that in the chat room, I would really appreciate it. Uh, let's get them some people over there to watch them. What are you on a regular schedule over there? No, so but I do go live pretty much almost every day on Instagram, and I go on there with all my friends and stuff, and we just hang out and BS and stuff. That's what I love about it because I don't care about the numbers, never have. It's it's always been about like just enjoying your time with the people that you love, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Rock on, man! Uh, life, there's too many snowflakes out there. I don't know, man. Uh, Mike's out in California. I kind of feel sorry for him out in Cali, man. Is it as bad as uh, we see it on the news with all this woke crap? Uh, I would say the main cities, yes. Uh, believe it or not, there's more cowboys in, in California than you think. When you get outside of LA and San, San Francisco, there's probably more cowboys here than you probably could have imagined. More Second Amendment people than you can imagine. More, you know, people who have this common mi- misconception that all of California is liberals. No, it's just two, two uh, cities that control all of that. That's it. Ain't it uh, pretty bad when you have the two cities that control everything for the state? It's like that in Illinois with Chicago. It's so I I know you understand the frustration. Trust <laughs> me, I know you know. The same thing, uh, but all right, no questions right there. Uh, I really appreciate having you on, Mike. Uh, it was a great subject. As far as tomorrow, we won't be having a second sh- uh, part of the show. China that was working in the morning, but we'll be back Tuesday. We will have a members only, though, tomorrow. We're going to be talking about hypocrisy. And, boy, I got something for that. But, uh, again, go join uh, Mike over on his Instagram. Hopefully, we can get him on uh, YouTube one of these days. Actually, I've I've started a little bit. That Mike Ball thing, I I do the shorts. I do the shorts. I don't do, like, vlogs and stuff like that, but I do the shorts. The shorts. Uh SNS just put uh Mike's IG contact. Thank you, brother SNS. There. So everybody, you have a great one. Welcome to the new members. Ma- made for streets. You're awesome, man. Uh, don't forget Monday uh through Friday, 9 20 a.m. Central. We go into a members only uh type of live stream. But uh with that, anything else, Mike? I just want to thank you, Hollywood, and every single person that sat here and listened through my story and what I had to say. That personally means the world to me. And I know that you guys can say whatever, you know what I mean? Like, But I'm just going to be honest that it, it means a lot to me for you guys to hear the things that, that other people go through. You know what I mean? That's oftentimes when we learn the most. So. Rock on, man. Well said, rock on. Okay, guys, uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Got a lot to say. Can't hold it in this time. Got no filter. I got no filter.